Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce the main uh, keynote speaker here in a moment. I'll be uh, talking about No Before a little later in the day at the uh, panel right after lunch. But now I'm going to introduce a man who, well, some say that cybersecurity started itself with him, with his electronic joyride when he was a youth. Um, many of the careers and uh, cybersecurity investments that you are involved in might not even have come into existence without him. I've uh, worked with Kevin for five years now, but this is the first time that we actually uh, share a stage, which is really cool. Um, Kevin is a, a top cybersecurity keynote speaker. Uh, he gets to travel all over the world, um, educating and showing the latest threats, some of which you are going to see today. Um, every single event in 2017 has had record attendance, and that is to some degree uh, caused by his, his drawing power. Um, he is the world's most famous hacker. There's no one like Kevin. He, he was once on the uh, FBI's most wanted list. I think you all know that. Uh, he co he uh, hacked into about 40 corporations just for the challenge. Um, Kevin is now a trusted security consultant for both um, Fortune 500 and basically worldwide governments. Um, in mass media, he is an author of multiple bestsellers, more than 50 countries, more than 20 languages. Um, he is the subject of countless stories, myths, movies, books. Uh, he was in theaters last year uh, in a film by Werner Herzog and is currently syndicated on the National Geographic Channel in a series called I Am Rebel in 170 countries. Um, KPMG compares him to uh, David Beckham or LeBron James. Uh, News.com calls him the Mick Jagger of our industry. Uh, he, is, um, he is truly one of the few global superstars in cybersecurity and his stories are legendary. Um, these are not titles he's very comfortable with, um, but I do know that as part of his security consulting business, uh, Kevin and his team of white hat hackers still maintain a 100% successful track record of being able to penetrate the security of any organization they are paid to hack using a combination of technical exploits and social engineering. Um, governments and industry use Kevin and his team to find the holes before the real bad guys do. And we're going to see some actual hacks today. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you the chief hacking officer of No Before and the world's most famous hacker who I'm also proud to call my friend Please welcome Kevin Mitnick. Thank you. Thank you very much. How's everybody doing? Fantastic. Great to be here. So, so <laughs> we're um, first of all, before anything else, um, when you're a hacker, you are kind of relying on the internet, and internet, uh, especially in downtown is somewhat spotty. So we're having a few demos here that do rely on the internet. If it works, everything goes fine. If it doesn't, we flip over to another demo. So uh, backups. Backups. Backups of backups. We, we do. So <laughs> yeah. It depends on Verizon in this case and how well it performs. So this may be a bit of a fluid situation, but first we're going to ask a few questions because most people are interested in, well, how did you get where you were? So, so Kevin, um, how did you get started in this business? Well, when I was a young kid, I was really fascinated with magic. And I used to ride my bike to the magic store on the weekends and after school to watch the guys in the magic shop perform the tricks over and over and over again because I always wanted to know the secret. So when I got to high school, I met this kid who can do magic with the telephone. He was involved in a hobby called phone freaking that's kind of the predecessor to computer hacking. 
In fact, uh, Steve Wozniak read an article in the 1971 edition of uh, Esquire magazine, and the article was called The Secrets of the Little Blue Box. And with this blue box, it emitted, emitted certain um, what we call multi-frequency tones, and you could actually control the phone system. And Steve liked doing things like calling the Pope. Jobs had the idea, maybe we can make some money with this. So they actually built these boxes, sold them on Berkeley's campus, and with the revenue they generated, they bought, uh, were able, to, from that revenue, buy the components to build the first Apple One board. I, however, went in a different direction. I was more of a prankster. So I liked doing things like changing my friend's home phone to a pay phone, so whenever his parents tried to make a call and say, please deposit 25 cents. <laughs> then my friend would call me all upset, change it back, change it back, and I'd change it to a prison phone, collect calls only. But, so another kid introduced me to the computer science instructor, thinking that I'd be interested in computers, and the, the comp sci uh, professor started asking me, have you had calculus, have you had physics, have you had all these prerequisites, are you a senior? And at the time I was a junior and I hadn't taken those classes yet, so he said, you know, I don't qualify, I'd have to try next year. And then my friend said, show Mr. Christ what you could do with the phone. So I sh started showing him all these tricks that I was able to do, like, Call one, uh, I can call one number, a friend can call another, and we'd secretly be joined. I had a secret number that you can dial and you put in the code, and you can call anywhere for free. And then the instructor uh, had a phone in the computer lab, and he wanted his wife to be able to call him, and, he, and the number wasn't on the phone. And he said, could you get that number? And I had the secret number you could dial, and the computer would read back what number it is. And so he waived the prerequisites, allowed me into class, and he probably regrets that decision today. <laughs> So the first programming assignment he gave the class to was to write a Fortran program to find the first 100 Fibonacci numbers. And at the time, I thought that was quite boring. And let me go back in time. Late 1970s, we had an Olivetti 110 baud terminal. That's 10 characters a second. We dial up to a PDP 1134 running Ristis E, an old operating system manufactured by DEC. And how we would do it, we'd dial up, we'd put the, uh, the phone cradle in the acoustic coupler modem, and that's how we would log in. That's back in the day. And I realized that the instructor never hung up the phone to log in. He would just type hello, put in his credentials, and when he was done, he'd type bye. And the students and the instructor used the same system, same terminal. So I had the idea, what if I could write a program that could simulate the operating system so when the teacher went to log in, rather than him talking to the operating system, he's talking to my program. And I could take his password, store it in the file, log him in. So in the late 1970s, I created a phishing program. Actually, it was my first program I actually ever written. And um, then it came time, uh, was able to get his credential. It was actually Johnco, J-O-H-N-C-O, and his name was John Christ. Not, not a difficult password. So then it came time to hand in the assignment. He's walking by everybody's desk. People are turning in their assignment. He gets up to my desk, I have nothing. And he goes, where's your assignment? I said, I didn't have time to do it. He says, I stuck my neck out let you into class and you're not even doing the work. I said, I wrote a cooler program. He goes, what are you talking about? I go, is it your password, Jonka? He goes, how? and he like, he goes, you know, he's shocked. He goes, how did you get my password? Well, I wrote a program to steal it. Here it is, and I turned in that program, gave him the source code. He got a huge smile on his face, got excited, wrote the code actually on the board at the time, and patted me on the back and gave me a lot of attaboys. So this was the ethics taught to young Kevin Mitnick that it's cool to hack. <laughs> That's how that went. That's how it started. Yep, that's how it started. Um, people are always surprised to know you still hack, aren't they? Pretty much. You know, I still hack. Don't tell anybody. But uh, I do it with authorization. So companies hire myself and my red team to test their security, whether it's physical, whether it's um, uh, you know wireless systems, doing technical types of uh, computer network exploitation, social engineering, which I'll get into in a moment. Basically, all the initial, uh, all the attack vectors that could be used against your business, we test the security controls to see if we could find flaws. And of course, report that to the client so they could fix the bugs. Exactly. So what we do here is a somewhat limited version of uh, Kevin's magic show. Um, <laughs> but can you give the audience a little taste of what we're going to see today? Sure. One, one area that I love testing that people don't really think about is physical security. 
How do you get into the building? Because once an attacker can get into the building, even though workstations are locked, we have ways to access them through what we call direct memory access attacks. So first of all, how do you get into the building? I was tasked to break into one of the three large credit bureaus. There's only three, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, and I was hired by one of those to break into their facility to see if I can get into their data center. And what I did, the information reconnaissance stage, I learned that they used access cards to get into the building. Now, all of you, when you have to go into the office after hours or even access to your building, you use cards or keys? Cards or keys? Cards, cards right? So the, I'd say the global provider of access card technology, the largest provider, is a company called HID, H-I-D. In fact, I have a HID reader here. And for this demonstration, I'd like to know if somebody in the audience could let us borrow your HID card because I actually want to show you how this works. Yeah, can you walk up on the stage? Give this guy a hand for, uh... thank you. We're switching computers, great. Now, all, not all HID cards are created equal. That's, uh, is that iClass? Let me see. Let's see if it even reads it. One second. Because there's different technologies. So first we're going to try his, see if we could read it. We can. So go ahead, Nathan. I'll sit down and I'll call you back up to go grab it. So the magic part is the site ID and the card ID. If we can get those two pieces of information, we can actually clone the card, open the door. So how does an attacker remotely able to steal your credentials? Well, for this credit bureau, I'll tell you the second part of the attack. Once I was able to breach the building, and they used HID too, and I'll get to that in a moment, um, I first I only had access to the floor. The only thing on the floor was doors with HID readers and the restroom, which didn't require a HID reader. So I had to hide out in the restroom, and when some guy went to use the urinal, I was actually able to remotely steal his credentials because I was able to get close enough to him. We go to extreme lengths, believe me. So let me actually show you how this works. So we have this device called the Proxmark 3, and this device could read cards from three inches away. So what I'm gonna do is arm it. And do you actually use this device? Do you hold it next to somebody? No, that's all. Wouldn't you step back as somebody's holding that to you? No, what you do is you conceal it in like a laptop sleeve. So here. It's like this. Doesn't this look fair? Would you be threatened if somebody's walking by you with this? Or if you're in the restroom standing here and I can get close enough, you're busy doing something and you could steal the card. So how does that actually work? So let me see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use one of these cards first. Then we'll use Nathan, L card, uh, Nathan L's card for the other attack. So we have a hid card. And we see the site ID is 113 and the card ID is 5477. Imagine the target's here, we just get that close. Take the device out. And then I, what I do is I put it into play mode. So now, let's see if this light lit. Right, so now this device will actually be the same as that card. So I put the device here. And it's the same card ID and side ID is the card that I stole. So with this, I was able, now that I had access to the floor, to get into the actual suite of the credit bureau where their data center was. But I know what all of you are thinking. There's no way I would let anyone within this close personal space. Don't worry, we have a solution for that. We have another device. This device is a hid reader that reads your card from three feet away. So do you carry this around and walk around and read people's cards? No, you put it into a backpack. It has a micro SD card in there, so it writes the credentials to the card, it has a Bluetooth module, so it actually transmits it to my iPhone. So how does this work? Put this down. Let me let you, let you see what the display looks like. So there's the actual display. So this three feet away, so if we get far enough away, could be some radio interference. Let me turn it back on. Sometimes what happens is, um, let me try with Nathan L's card first, because I think this is iClass. I'm not sure it would work with i. Yeah, so Nathan L's card, we have facility 53, card ID 51203. Uh, 
So we're able to remotely steal anybody's credentials from three feet away. I took this to the RSA security conference last year, put it in the backpack, walked around the vendor hall, and was able to get 158 cards, right? Very easy to do. So how was I able to get to the office suite of the credit bureau? It was in a very large building, uh, multiple tenants, multiple floors. I think it was like at least over 30 stories. What I had to do is set up an appointment with the leasing office under the pretext that I was gonna lease office space. So I show up in my nice suit, and the young lady that was with the leasing office is walking around. She's showing me the different suites that are available, and I'm negotiating price with her. How much is it for a five-year lease? How much is it for a 10-year lease? You know, how much, how, much, uh, how much funds do I get to improve the property? I'm trying to get her mind off security. And, and, you know, and she's walking around, she's throwing, uh, showing me all these different uh, places. Um, I'm carrying my daily planner. And then I ask her, how many keys do we get? I have 50 employees. She goes, sir, you don't, we don't give you keys, we give you cards. And I see one dangling on her belt, right? I go, oh, and she, shows, she kind of turns over and shows, shows me the card on her hip. I said, could I, could I, could I see that? So she hands me the card, I see her picture, I go, I go, that's a cool picture, and I hand it back. Just within a second, what she doesn't know is I have a hit reader in here. So I'm able to steal the credentials. But what's cool about this hit reader, and this is Nathan Ells' card. Oh, I don't know how that happened. Let's put this back. We're gonna switch back to this system here. So here's Nathan Ells' card. 53 is the side ID, a card is 52103. Then what I'm able to do is take an empty card, hid card, put it here, nothing. It's just basically blank. I put it onto my device, hit one button, and this becomes a clue. So now this card is the same as Nathan L's card. So what I was able to do is get access to the entire building especially the freight elevator, got to that floor level, hid out in the restroom, used the Proxmark 3, was able to get an employee's hid credentials, was able to breach the data center, and once I got inside, was able to compromise all their IT just because we're able to violate physical security. So first, Nathan, I'll let me give you a card back. Jeez. So you have to be concerned about your physical security as well as your IT security. Thank you, for, thank you again. And if you ever lose that card, here's your backup. <laughs> you get to play Ocean's Eleven. There you go. All day long. Right. <laughs> How do you prevent this? How do you prevent it? HID has different technology. He, Nathan L's using Prox. There's iClass. Okay. There's SE. And the thing is, with SE, with SE, we can read the card remotely with those long-range readers, but we can't still. We haven't cracked how to write an SE card. So if you have HID technology make sure your reader is SE only, that it's not backwards compatible to iClass or Prox, and that way it mitigates that type of risk that I was able to show you today. So SE, no, no backwards, no backwards uh, compatibility, SE readers only. Very go. good, excellent. Um, so the next thing is, what would happen if someone gives you an assignment to get into an, a workstation, but from the outside? Outside. How would well, you do that? There's two methods that are the best for an, from an attacker perspective at compromising a business. One is exploiting AppSec, bugs in internet-facing web applications, and the second is good old social engineering. So I'm going to demonstrate a social engineering attack, and imagine, think of this, what happens if I want to compromise a law firm, and I call the law firm, I explain I have this case, you know, you know, it could be a divorce case. It could be a, cr well, not a criminal case. I don't like those anymore. <laughs> so, divorce case. And uh, I talk to, you know, the secretary. She's going to, you know, put me in touch with the partner. But I want to send them all these docs. And I say, well, I'm going to send you my case file. It's in a PDF. And what are the chances that the partner's secretary or even the partner himself or herself will open up a PDF file, especially if the antivirus on the gateway of the company and on the endpoint basically says that file's okay. What are the chances? So I'm gonna show you how we do this. 
Hopefully the internet will work. So we're going to go back to computer two. It's weird. Every time I uh, uh, like switch computers, it actually like puts it in screensaver mode. So over here on this computer in this white screen, this is what we call a Trojan listener. And when the attacker successfully exploits the target, we're going to get a connection here, which will give us full control of the victim computer. Over here on computer, want to come up? There we go. Here we have over here a netbook running the Windows 7 OS. I updated the patches last night, and I have a McAfee antivirus here, and I updated the, the virus definitions actually last night as well. So this kind of represents what we still see in businesses. I don't see a lot of Windows 8 and not a lot of Windows 10 deployed. I still see Windows 7 and unfortunately Windows XP. So imagine the target gets an email and in the, there's an attachment. Here's a file called nomalwarehere.pdf. So just based on the name, you could trust it, right? No. So let's actually check with the AV product. We're going to right click it. We're going to scan for threats. We're going to continue. And it says it's not found. I'll blow this up for you a little bit, make it a little bit larger. You can see that the AV product basically said it's a clean file. We could bypass any what we call PSP, personal security product. It doesn't matter what AV it is, uh, it could be bypass. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and sure we have wireless here, that we're going to go ahead and open the file. And because of how this is working, it's going to have the property of like when somebody opens it, it like freezes. So if you try minimizing it, it uh, doesn't do anything. If you try maximizing, nothing, OK? And then it finally closes. Well, now the rootkit is actually installed on this machine. So if the, if the IT department tries to look at processes, the registry, or network connections, it's actually invisible because we modified the operating system. If we go back to the attacker computer, we, we'll have something that comes up here. This is a Trojan. With this Trojan, we could steal your keystrokes. So when you log on to websites or you log on to, like, you know, like let's say your bank or internal applications, <clears throat> we could steal your credentials. We could actually, if the user is away from their computer, enable remote desktop and actually control their machine. What about laptops? What do laptops have that's kind of special? Built-in microphones. So we can enable the microphone, and your laptop becomes a room bug. So when you bring that into the board meeting, the attacker gets to listen to whatever is said in that board meeting. What my favorite is, is actually turning on the victim's webcam so I can see who I hacked. So let's go ahead and do that. So to this, we'll go into spy functions. We'll put in webcam capture. We'll hit start. I'll make this a little bit bigger for you. I'll do that for you. Go ahead in front, <laughs> this, this computer. And now we could spy Hello. on the victim, right? Because we see him, this is on the attacker machine, right? So the bottom line is you don't want this software or this malware. What we call malware in the business is an implant. A lot of times we're in, when we install these implants, it's in memory only, it's not on disk. It makes it very difficult for your personal security products to detect. And again, all PSPs could be bypassed. So this is kind of a, um, an example of types of Trojans. But in the real world, we're really using command line. We don't really use these point and click type of GUI interfaces. So there you go. Let me awesome. actually, un I don't like this on my computer. So I'm going to stop it. I'm going to uninstall it. And one other thing we could actually do that I didn't mention is if any of the any users have stored their credentials in Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, um, Safari, we could actually extract your credentials that you've stored because they're in the crypt store, and basically you know have access to whatever credentials that you have saved. Again, once the attacker puts an implant on your machine, it's usually game over. Yeah, and that is just uh, some employee in any kind of organization double-clicking on a PDF, and that's the only thing it takes. Um, we have a few minutes left, and um, uh, we were just discussing WannaCry ransomware a little earlier. Um, would anyone like to see the WannaCry ransomware actually in action, the real deal? 
Yeah, let me show you how, actually how this works. So how WannaCry spread was there is a Windows service called SMB, okay? Uh, normally companies do not have SMB exposed to the internet. However, it's a shame, but I'll show you real quick. Is there's a site called Shodan that basically where, hold on one second, uh, where there's been scans of the internet, essentially. And what we could do is we could look for certain types of information. So what I'm gonna do is look and see what, how many systems out there have port 445 open? So I'm gonna do a search here. And if we look, it's 1.6 million, right in the left-hand corner. So those, those, that's how many systems out there, could be consumer, could be business, have port 445 open. And what WannaCry did is it exploited an NSA uh, exploit called internal blue. And how it spread was by gaining access to SMB, exploiting a software flaw in the SMB network service, and then the payload was actually the ransomware. And we all know what ransomware is. It's basically a type of malware that encrypts all your files. And then it will pop up a message basically demanding payment or you don't get the key to unlock your files. So actually, how does this actually work? So I'm gonna close up Shodan. Don't need this. And while you do that, yep. um, this uh, WannaCry was actually the very first, not ransomware, it was ransomware, but it was the first ransom worm. This thing spread like a traditional computer worm, which uh, is, uh, if you remember, there have been earlier ones. Uh, these things are automated and they can spread in 10 minutes through the whole internet. And that's the kind of thing that, uh, that we saw. Um, the North Koreans are supposedly behind this one, and uh, let's see how it works. Actually, because the shadow brokers had dumped or leaked a bunch of NSA, basic NSA cyber, weapon, uh, cyber weapons from 2013, anybody could have wrapped those exploits around a worm. Uh, it reminds me of about 10 years ago when David Litchfield, another security researcher, found a vulnerability in Microsoft SQL. And when that was publicized, somebody wrapped that into a worm and it became SQL Slammer. So it's very similar. So basically, here I have, uh, e you ever, you know, how this attack would work in real life is it would again require some setup. This is contacting the target company, um, maybe via email may or telephone, and trying to set up an appointment. And normally, you know, People use freeconference.com, they use GoToMeeting, so it's very normal when you're expecting it to get an invite to go to a conference meeting. You know, GoToMeeting, what are the other ones? Uh, freeconference.com, yeah, there's, a, there's a few of them out there. Yep. So here I'm logged into one of my email accounts and I have an invite for the cyber investment discussion at 9.30 today. I'm probably running a little bit late, but we'll open it anyway. Hold on a second, let me, there we go. And over here is basically the typical thing that you normally see. You know, you have the access code, you have the hyperlink to the GoToMeeting site, and uh, what normally people do is click on the hyperlink in the email to go ahead and join the meeting. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then we get the GoToMeeting. I forgot what the code was, but we could go back. Oops. And we'll get the meeting number here. We'll copy it. We'll go back, we'll paste it in. And we'll join the meeting. And before you could join any meeting, whether you're on a Mac or whether you're on your Windows, uh, the GoToMeeting opener has you uh, so, so click run to start the meeting, so we'll go ahead and do that. Click run. It's running a scan, I don't want to do autocomplete. And we'll wait. Let me actually minimize this. This will take about 60 seconds. And what the trick here was, is that wasn't really go to meeting. 
what I did is I registered a domain called gotomeeting.us.com, which looks like it's really GoToMeeting, but it goes to one of my sites. And on my site, I host the payload for the WannaCry worm. So here we go. It's encrypting the files, and I got the pop-up. This is the real worm right here that's uh, on this uh, virtual machine. And it basically warns me that I have to make payment by such and such time. If I don't do it in two days and you know, 23 hours, the price goes up. And if you don't do it in six days, you lose your files forever. So fortunately, uh, the security researchers in France, maybe a little bit too late, one of these brilliant researchers realized when, you, when the victim's infected with WannaCry, it actually, you could extract the prime numbers that were used to create the RSA which is an uh, encryption, okay, RSA decryption key to actually decrypt the files, but that requires that the victim doesn't reboot their system because then that, those keys are lost in memory. So now this machine's completely infected. If I take a look at it, we'll bring up a, what we call a Windows shell. We'll do a directory, and I'll enlarge this. Let me go to the desktop, actually. Whoops, it keeps popping up this annoying ransom thing. But if we like, take a look, we see these files with the WNCRY extension, those files have been corrupted, yep. right? And those were originally normal, normal working files. Those are the, this is the real infection here. So what are the three things that you recommend that companies do to prevent this from happening? Well, as far as, far as social engineering, security awareness and training, which everybody already knows, but I heavily, well, I vigorously recommend, I actually work with Stu on this, is actually inoculating your employees and your contractors against these type of phishing attacks. And how do you inoculate? You know, kind of give, you know, give, a, give a, like the flu shot and hopefully your body builds enough antibodies to fight off the real flu, is you actually attack your own employees. But I recommend that you don't attack them without giving them notice because you don't want to re reduce employee morale. You want to let them know they are tested time to time to improve the security of the business. And when they're tested, when they fall for these types of attacks, rather than getting something like WannaCry, what, they, what happens is it gives a splash screen, right? Letting the employer contractor know that they made a mistake, and that becomes a very teachable moment. So now we could train that user on, this is the type of attacks that are in the wild, and this is what you need to look out for. So over time, people become inoculated in my mind. Now, is there someone that could still fall for it? Yes, but at least we reduce that percentage. Of course, you layer this with other type of technologies that hopefully detect implants and uh, types of implants that attackers you know, use in the wild. But unfortunately, again, we could bypass every PSP. Update your third-party software, not just your operating system, but like how I did the PDF exploit, I exploited a vulnerability in Adobe 11. And through an exploit, exploitation of this vulnerability, I was able to get what we call remote code execution and was able to actually install my own software. So Adobe 11 had been patched. So what's important is all third-party software be patched on your user's desktops. How can you do this? There's a product out there, I think it's free, called Personal Software Inspector. And what it does, it looks for third-party apps, not your operating system, but Java, Adobe, messaging services like ADM and Trillium, these types of uh, third-party apps, and make sure that you are keeping those up to date. Finally, firewall rules. Whenever an attacker puts an implant, whether it's in memory or on disk, of one of your users, guess what? That implant must communicate out to the internet to the attacker C2 server, what's C2 command and control server. So why is this successful? Because companies are really good, well, IT departments, at setting up firewall ingress rules, what's allowed into the company. Usually only port 80 and 443, which is just web services, but they don't do such a good job on egress rules. They allow too many services out say port 53, which is DNS, or SSH, or remote desktop, which is on port 3389, and then the implant can connect to the attacker C2 server over these ports. So it's important that your IT department reduce the amount of egress ports 
And anything that's allowed out shall go through a, a web application proxy because it makes it more difficult for the attacker. Is there implants out there that are proxy aware? Yes. But the whole idea here is we're trying to raise the bar and mitigate risk. Very good. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Stu. You bet. Yeah. And, and by the way, if I see you out there, I have a cool gift I brought for everybody. It's my card. And what's unique about my card, it actually has a tool set. It's not dental tools, by the way. This is a lock pick set. Lock. So if you lock yourself out of your home or office, just think of Kevin Mitnick, and I'll open the door for you. Absolutely. Thank you. We, uh... Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, before we go, I would like to give one quick shout out to Mr. John Rayfuse over here. He's Kevin's agent for speaking and endorsements. Uh, he set this up at the last moment. Uh, John is the uh, Jerry Maguire of cyber, and if you want to work with Kevin, he's the guy. Uh, how did I do? You just, okay, thanks. Um, you will uh, see me right after lunch where uh, I will be in the panel uh, and we'll talk about the work that Kevin and I do with security awareness training. So thank you very much. And we're going to break down this uh, very quickly and we're getting ready for the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you.